This is indeed a very special, special seminar. Um, it's going to be a seminar given by Dr. Dave McKeel. And I'm, it's a special honor for me to introduce a, a fine colleague as well as a good friend of mine, and I'm sure a good friend of many of you, yours. Um, so I'm going to use probably no more than two minutes. So uh, For the last two weeks, Dave has been very nice to me because he's worried about I say bad things. <laughs> Or, or make some inappropriate jokes in front of everybody. So, so I'm going to stick to the script here. Um, so <coughs> we asked uh, Dave to uh, write up his uh, introduction slide. And, and then two days ago, he you know, to me, he said, this is it. So he gave me the same slide, right? <laughs> the simplest form. But what, what it really shows is, is um, he is a man of uh, action, uh, less words, uh, when a few words. And you can see from the history that uh, he, I just very quickly go down here, and uh, he's currently our principal scientist. And he graduated from UC Davis in genetics uh, and agronomy. And then he started his career quite early at URI, in fact. Uh, he did part of the work at ECOSET, but then at that time, I believe, it was somewhat related, uh, linked with URI. And then he became a URI prime reader in 1982 and 1991. And then he left. He had a long sabbatical at UC Davis, at the ALS. Um, at that time, we have a wave of returning scientists, and then I think Dave is one of them. Uh, in, in 2001, he, he, he came back to URI, uh, become the uh, scientist and also the program leader and also the head of the division. So only until recently that his workload just get too much that uh, he, he dropped the division head job and then Dr. Bra took over and then he remained the program leader. And his research interest is broad, as you can see at the bottom here. Uh, he was a range of lowland rice breeding program, uh, program leader at one point. And his real passion is about rice genetics. And you can tell that uh, those of you who have been here long enough that uh, after Dr. Kush left, <coughs> he took over the rice genetics symposium every, every, every four years and five years. And, and, and he's been the uh, Erie's icon for rice genetics. And you can see that he listed his interests here uh, from the standpoint of body, a, a body stresses. And so, and, and more, most recently, he's Mr. Submergence, as you well know. <laughs> now, so this is his slide. So, uh, so I, I thought, this is really not fair to have, to have <laughs> one single slide today. Now, this is an authorized uh, slide. So, trust me, I have, a, I have to, mobilize a whole division to look for this picture. <laughs> that is, the criteria is repair. Okay. So <laughs> finally, we find, so, I mean, back, you can tell from the pants, is bell bottom pants, <laughs> all in the seventh. So, so I just want to see that, say, say one, one word here is Mr. Humble. I mean, just his introdu introduction side of himself is so simple, but indeed he did a lot. And you can see that I just put up some of the achievement he has here. He received numerous awards, and he's the active fellows of uh, several uh, professional societies. So what I find a word is that they have all the attributes as a good scientist. I always call him a, a modern breeder. So he doesn't quarrel with those biotech or conventional breeding. He embodied both. So that's someone that we treasure a lot at Erie, that be able to integrate everything and be able to reason with you but not shouting at you. So he, he has this attribute of, of sitting in a room, listening, and say a few words, and get things done. So these are the kind of colleagues we, we value extremely. Um, um, so finally, I'd like to uh, work for words, say something, and uh, uh, citing something you'll hear later on. I'd like to conclude saying that Dr. McHugh's leadership, wisdom, and commitment to the application of right science for development of what makes him one of the most highly respected individuals in the world of agricultural science. And this is a line not written by me, it's by my son, Kyla. So, so they follow yours. Well, thank you, Hey. Um, <clears throat> it's true what he said, that he made me uh, behave very nice to him uh, 
the last few weeks, but I, I don't know why he has that. I, I always behave uh, very nicely. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I'd like to start by pointing out something on this, uh, this slide that basically, uh, as Hay mentioned, I had three jobs at Erie uh, and at UC Davis, three main jobs. And, I, and what I'm going to try to do is uh, give some idea of some of the things that not only that I did during this time, but also uh, related to the things going on at Erie and, and the world of rice breeding. And um, in case you want to know how much time I spent in each of these jobs, it's there. So that gives you an idea of why I have to leave <laughs> at this time. <laughs> now, um, I mentioned that uh, my title, uh, Stress Tolerant Rice, 35 Years of Progress. I picked uh, 1975 for a few reasons, mainly because that's when I started my career on rice, really. Uh, but it's also a time that was of significance, I think, in theory for what was going on here as well. Um, and I'm going to do this like, like, uh, like my thesis. So this is like a thesis of my, my work at Erie, and I'll do it in chapters. So I have five chapters which represent uh, different phases of the work on stress on rice, as well as my own uh, involvement. So um, I'm starting from 75, and um, I have a picture of the Green Revolution. And I think that for people of my generation, the Green Revolution was huge inspiration for us. So really to, to see what went on in places like Erie and Simit, and especially what went on at, at Erie regarding rice, was really something amazing and something that all of us really looked at and saying, wow, um, you know, I want to do something like that, because that was really great, that being able to do something which affects so many people. So that inspired a lot of us to, to go into rice or to go into agricultural science. Now this is my uh, hometown. So I, in 1975, I was, I was here in uh, San Diego. That's where I grew up. And this picture is taken from more or less from where the University of California campus uh, goes to the edge of the, of the uh, Pacific Ocean. And that, uh, that pier there is Scripps, uh, here, Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And in fact, uh, just on the other side of that, uh, right over around there, that's where uh, I spent my, my young years, in that water there. Uh, I was a surfer, and I was spending a lot of time both on the waves and being submerged by the waves. And I was thinking, well, is there a career in this? And uh, my answer was no, no career in this. So I got interested in agriculture, and that's the time I moved to Davis, where the main campus uh, which relates uh, to agriculture in UC is. And this is a picture of my, my major professor, uh, Neil Recker, here. That's H.P. Uh, Moon, you may know him. Of course, you know Gurdjieff Kush. This was at the Genetic Symposium. But uh, I met uh, Neil Recker by chance because I was looking for a job and I wanted to find out what's going on you know, with agriculture. And so I was walking around and, and somebody said, well, I think there's a job in the rice project, so why don't you go check over there? And I went there and he said, well, uh, I hired somebody already, but you know, I'll, I'll think about it and see if I have money. So uh, eventually he hired me as, a, as an undergraduate student. And that was in 1975. So that's when I started working on rice. And um, one of the things he did, which I still remember, is he gave me, he, he said, here's a book. This book uh, is the Bible of rice. It has everything you need to know about rice. He gave that book to me. That was the Erie Annual Report. And he said every time the annual report comes out, he reads it cover to cover. He said that it's, this is the, the best place to find out about what's going on with rice. So of course, I got kind of inducted into what was going on at Erie and uh, very excited about the possibility of spending time and working on rice uh, at Erie. And so another opportunity came by meeting some of the rice breeders like uh, Ronnie Kaufman and Gordon Kush and the chance to actually do my thesis work at Erie. So I went to uh, Erie in 1978 to do my uh, thesis work. So I just given away how, how old I am, you all know. But uh, I started doing my thesis work in 1978 under a fellowship by Rockefeller Foundation. And that's where I really got the, uh, the excitement of the work on rice. Now, at that time, at Erie, um, this publication came out. Actually, this came out in 1975. And this is one of the things I read when I went to Erie. And I, 
I was also intrigued by, and, and uh, really excited by this, the, this idea. What they're saying is that the Green Revolution, by this time, it only affected about one-fourth of rice farmers. So you can see one farmer who has a lot of rice, and then there's a lot of other farmers who don't have much rice. So what, what about the other three? That's what they were asking. What, what happens to these farmers? And they call these the, the, the fortunate uh, quarter is this, is this group of farmers. And those group of farmers were still uh, unfortunate. So they haven't, haven't yet benefited. And of course, one of the main reasons was uh, they have unfavorable conditions for rice. They have uh, stresses, all kinds of problems. So what about those three fours? What, what do we do for them? Now, um, just before that, Erie has started this uh, genetic evaluation and utilization program. And what this was, was a large scale uh, screening of germplasm, evaluation of germplasm for all the kind of traits you could think of, and then identification of the best donors, and then started using those donors in crossing and so forth. So this was a very, um, this was in the time when, you know, you could basically get a lot of money to do anything at Erie. There was a lot of money coming in. And so they could do these large scale projects. They, they hired a ton of people and they started screening everything. And in fact, we're still using the material that was identified during this GEU program. So it was, it was a very nice way. And it got all the scientists involved. All the scientists were involved in breeding. It, it wasn't just breeders, it was, it was everyone. Physiologists, pathologists, entomologists. Everybody was working on this to identify the best donors. That there were other things going on. I'm not saying this was all that Erie was doing, but this was the effort on germplasm, a uh, very coordinated program and very good one. One of the results, uh, work of Ben Vergara and Ori Mazzaredo to screen the germplasm for submergence tolerance. So, uh, of course, that's going to be one of my main uh, topics today on submergence tolerance. So I wanted to highlight that work that they did, and they identified the main submergence tolerant donors that we still use, uh, although we're using, of course, the, the genes mostly, but we still go back and use these varieties for various reasons. And uh, in fact, we haven't gotten everything out of them that we could get out of them. So we're still benefiting from this large screening program, GEU screening program. Uh, and uh, FR13, I have a picture there, which is the main variety that was the source of the sub-1 gene. Now, at the same time, the breeders were starting to cross these varieties and transfer these traits, although they didn't know, uh, in, in many cases, they didn't know anything about the genetics, but they started transferring these traits into the high yielding varieties. Uh, I actually knew the guy on the right, that's H.K. Uh, Mohanty, uh, one of the Mohantis from Marissa, and uh, he was a, a breeder from OUAT, and uh, he made this cross with FR13A because he was from the place uh, where FR13A was identified. And um, that cross uh, at, at the right house in 1979, which he made, uh, was developed into a breeding line, which was the summit dwarf. It showed that the summit dwarf gene uh, could be combined with submergence tolerance. And also, uh, another area breeder, Dirk Hillary's Lambers, was working on that, and I learned a lot from him. And uh, eventually, we developed this line, which I'll mention a little bit later. But a lot of this uh, very important work happened during this period of time, mid uh, to late 1970s. Now, um, as Hay mentioned already, I, I was hired by Erie in 1982 as plant breeder. I have no idea why they hired me. But uh, I, have a, I have a thinking about that, that they wanted me to work on rainfed oil and rice, and nobody else wanted to work on rainfed oil and rice. So I got the job as the young guy to work on rainfall load and rice. Um, and generally, at that time, it was regarded as, uh, well, okay, when you're, when you're new, you can work on rainfall load and rice. If you get better or if you, if you get promoted, you, you might get to the point where you can actually work on irrigated rice. So <laughs> rainfall load and rice was considered a, yeah, kind of a starting area. And then if you were good, you, you, you would graduate. In fact, um, our own DG was, uh, he came as the program leader for Renfrew Lowland, and he did such a fantastic job. They, they promoted you, right? They, you went to your game class. <laughs> so it, it shows you that, um, you know, this is the kind of the, it was a difficult environment, right? That's what we call difficult 
environments. I, I met a lot of breeders, and uh, they were working on rainfed on the rise. And I would go and say, yeah, what about drought, submergence? And they would say, yeah, oh, drought, submergence. But I'm really interested in bacterial blight and gallmage and irrigated rice. But, you know, just because I was inter interested in drought and submergence, they, they, they had to talk to me about that. I, I was also pretty lonely. There wasn't any coordinated effort. There was other people who were interested in rainfed rice, but there was no kind of a coordinated program on how to deal with the problems of rainfed ro rolling rice. So, I was kind of working on my own, and it was easy to see that this was not a problem of just varieties. This was a, this was the whole system, you know, the management and social aspects and everything. So uh, I really felt like it, we would benefit by having a more uh, coordinated effort on that, and of course, eventually that came about. Now, um, at the time, uh, uh, the two major things that I was looking at were drought tolerance and uh, submergence, the two main abiotic stresses which really define the rain-fed environments, the rain-fed lowland environments. And um, I found drought tolerance work uh, to be a bit frustrating. Uh, when I first came, they showed me uh, these kind of pictures. I, I'm not sure if you could really see that, what, what I'm showing here, but it, this uh, was the large-scale screening, which was part of the GU program, on screening for drought tolerance. And what they were doing was they, they would seed these in upland condition and then apply ser serious drought stress, which was in the dry season, and try to kill everything off. And then there were plants like this one that just stayed green and survived. And then when you rewater, they would, they would grow. So um, when I first came, they were saying like, you know, this, this is tremendous opportunity because you could see huge differences <coughs> in genotypes. Uh, but then what I noticed is that I would, I would do the screening under this condition and then I would take it to the farmer's field. This was a field test done in Tha Northeast Thailand at that time. And what I found is that there was no connection between what would happen here and what happened here. They, they, were not, they were not related. So I don't think people want to hear that. They said, well, we have this drought screening program and it's doing fantastic, but if I say, well, it, the, the material is coming from there, they don't, they don't perform well, and they didn't like to hear that. So uh, it was a bit frustrating, but what I could say is that we did, in the end, find uh, some materials that were that were okay under drought tolerance, and so I think there was there was some uh, progress made. Um, some of the uh, the donor varieties uh, that people have been using for genetics and other things uh, came out of that project. And this is one variety that was released in uh, Laos. It's a glutinous variety, and I don't think it had much drought tolerance, but it was one of the first good glutinous varieties uh, built up there and became their most popular variety. So this came out of our breeding program in Northeast Thailand, so at least there was something uh, useful that came out of the work on drought. In the case of uh, submergence, I think it was much more uh, successful, uh, as you might expect, because of having a major gene trait, although we didn't know it was a, it was a sub-1 gene at that time. Uh, but we did develop some breeding lines that performed very well under submergence. This is the one I mentioned earlier, our IR49830-7. It, com it was the first time to really combine high yield with submergence tolerance. Now here it's a little bit intermediate, it's not as tolerant as the highest ones. Uh, but uh, when I left Erie in the 1991, Dr. Surapong Sakurong came and took over that job and he did some further work and he found out that this one really had very good submergence tolerance. And so he used this widely uh, in all the crosses he made for submergence tolerance, most of the crosses he made. Um, and I wanted to mention the good work of uh, two of the main staff I had at that time. This is Modesto Amante uh, and Borel Pamplona. And they were instrumental. They were working with me on rain and and rice. Now, Modesto was working on the submergence project uh, and the medium deep project. And Goroy was working on the drought project. Uh, and interesting, uh, after I came back, it was the opposite. Now, Modesto went to uh, drought and Goroy went to submergence. Uh, but that's a long story. But um, uh, one other variety that came out was this variety, RC68, which was actually released uh, after I left Erie. But uh, Boroi was instrumental in that. And that uh, variety was actually released because of some drought tolerance. In fact, Arvin was telling me it has some drought tolerance. But it has very good submergence tolerance. And in fact, it wasn't appreciated until, until more recently that RC68, which we call IR119, is uh, one of the best uh, varieties that we have for submergence tolerance 
and it has some moderate fault tolerance. So there, there were some uh, good things that came out of that project, but in general, um, I could say that uh, uh, there was a long way to go because there was nothing really that uh, became very, very uh, successful. So um, I wanted to go to the next phase, which uh, I spent in, uh, in Davis, in California, and I called it genetics, the next chap chapter of genetics, which is what I started doing. I started working on, more on genetics and molecular markers. And um, at this stage, uh, my graduate student, I, I had a picture of my graduate student there, Kenok Shu. He started working with me on uh, looking at uh, submergence tolerance. And we were able to identify this major PTL, the, uh, which we call sub-1. And uh, the sub-1 gene uh, turned out to be quite interesting because of such a strong effect. Uh, in fact, um, it basically is a major gene. But it wasn't really much appreciated until we, we did this mapping work that it was a major gene. And um, eventually, of course, the gene was cloned. And I'd like to thank uh, also many people involved. This is uh, Pam Ronald at UC Davis, who is Canon here. And uh, Shaw, his, his wife, and Patrick, who was doing the transformation. So they basically did the transformation work to confirm the effect of sub-1. And uh, special thanks to Zeebrit, who joined me at the time. To, to finish to try to finish this project and at the time it was very things were going very quite difficult but she helped a lot to really uh, push it through to the conclusion and then of course Julia Betty Sirius and Abdul uh, my colleagues so all of them were uh, joining us to to actually end up identifying the the uh, sub one gene now um, this uh, this was designed by my daughter Bianca it's the sub one uh, picture of the sub one gene. In the form of a submarine, a yellow submarine, and uh, it's a little bit of a cartoonish submarine, but uh, it also looks a little bit like a rice grain. You can see that, and we call it the submarine gene. So uh, Bianca gave me permission to use this in my slideshow, and I think she would be amenable to Erie if they wanted to license this on reasonable terms. So it could be could be something you, you might think about. Now. Um, in addition to submergence, there were many other QTLs identified. In fact, uh, I think uh, 1990s was kind of the decade of QTLs. There were so many QTLs mapped and, of course, continued after that. Uh, this was from a paper that I wrote with uh, Henry Newman on Mainfield Lord and Rice. So we have sub-1, we have uh, photograph sensitivity, and we have all these uh, drought traits here. And <clears throat> so we started thinking about how to use all these QTLs for breeding, but there wasn't really a clear um, idea about how to use these QTLs at that time. So I go to my fourth chapter, uh, which is after I returned to Erie, uh, called Release and Adoption. So this is where we had made some rapid progress in breeding for submergence and other stresses. Uh, I want to show a diagram which I've used many times. And this <coughs> shows the process of backcrossing, molecular-assisted backcrossing, or marker-assisted backcrossing, I should say, to introduce the sub one gene into a particular variety, a mega variety. This, in this case, we use Swarna uh, by using two backcrosses. And we select here for a very small integration of sub-1. So this idea was, uh, was not really uh, something that I invented. It was uh, actually described by Steve Thanksley as early as, I think, 1989. And so uh, not many people used it, though. Um, but I started to use that. Ken and I started to use this a procedure at UC Davis, uh, and we had a variety uh, called M202, which is the dominant California variety. So that's what I was working on at that time. And it was successful to develop a M202 sub-1. However, the California was not interested in sub-1, so that I mean, there was no really benefit because they don't have a problem of submergence. But uh, Julia uh, Betty Sirius did go on and use the material with her postdoc, uh, Takeshi Fukao, to, to study the um, the effects of the sub-1 gene and to identify the mechanism and so forth. So it was useful from a basic standpoint, but um, you know, it wasn't, and, and, and Davis is not a good place to do this kind of work. It, it takes really a lot of, of work and effort to do this. So uh, of course that was one of the things I was really interested in doing uh, when I came back to Neary. Um, now, I want to emphasize the reason, the, the problem of leakage drag, because I think it's uh, not well appreciated. So I apologize. Uh, for uh, non-genesis, but I'll just talk a little bit about linkage drag, uh, which I think is a, a, a big problem with backcrossing. 
And this is a, di a, theor a theoretical uh, diagram of what happens during backcrossing in terms of the percent uh, donor genome. So this, so once you make a, an F1, this is about 50 percent, right? And then, and then uh, in each generation of backcrossing, it goes down by by half. So it goes down to a quarter. That's that's the average figure because you you just keep diluting the donor genome. Now, what happens with the non-carrier chromosomes, the ones where you don't have the the, the gene is not on those chromosomes, uh, it, it drops very rapidly in backcrossing. So by by backcross six, you don't have too many of those fragments left, and then it declines uh, rapidly. Uh, after that, you get hardly anything left on the non-donor, on the non-carrier chromosome. On the carrier chromosome, it's different. Uh, it starts a little bit lower because it's just one chromosome, but it persists. And the reason it persists is because you don't get enough recombination normally uh, to, to make the fragment small. And so it, you, you end up having big fragment size. And one of my students actually uh, measured this up through, I think, BC3. He found that the size of a fragment was about 15 uh, megabases of DNA after three back process, which was which is about half of a chromosome. And it doesn't go down that fast. So you end up transferring a lot of genes with, with the gene you're trying to introduce. You're transferring a lot of the donor chromosome with it. Um, now, this is Septi. Uh, everybody knows her. And Septi did a lot of work in my uh, my project, so I could put her picture on a lot of slides, but I'll, I'll put it here because this was made of her data. Uh, what she looked at was um, microsatellite markers, and we could we could probably do update this with uh, with the uh, chip-based markers, but this was done with microsatellite. So um, this is the FR13A chromosome, and all the FR13A alleles are red, and this is a breeding line IR40931. It has some pink, which means non non FR13A alleles, and this is the IR49830, which I mentioned earlier, and uh, this is a, my uh, point for unfounded speculation, which I think is a good place. I think the Erie Thursday seminar is a good place for, for saying this. So I, I, I'm going to give you my un, unfounded speculation. That uh, you look at uh, this, this pretty green line, uh, it, this side, of, uh, the, the sub one gene is at the top of the rice chromosome. So the chromosome goes way over here, OK? So, so this is just a part of it, and it, it keeps going. So it, obviously, there was a uh, recombination here. Uh, in this line. And so uh, it got rid of um, the FR13A part, and it's something else. And this was the first line which we had, which was high yielding and uh, had good plant type, many good traits from FR13A. So my uh, speculation is that uh, this part of the gene, uh, genome of FR13A has genes which are very, uh, not very good for rice, for high yielding rice at least, we could say. And uh, in some of these early lines, they still had this. And as a result, they're low yielding, they have bonds, they have other problems. Uh, it was only by chance, uh, of course, an expert um, visual observation by the breeders, that we got this recombination. So this, to me, points out the importance of linkage drag when you're introducing genes from exotic varieties, uh, including germplasm, that this is a problem. This is a diagram. Um, made by uh, Bert Collard. And Bert Collard is, by the way, uh, joining Erie in a couple months, so he'll be taking over this work on submergence. I'm very happy about that. And uh, so Bert and I worked on this uh, paper, the three stages of mar marker-assisted backcrossing. So we have three stages. One is the selection of, selection of the target gene. The second one is the uh, recombinant selection. So you select for recombination on either side. That means uh, you look for the, the uh, non-donor allele on either side. And these markers are close to the gene. They're usually around three to five stem organs apart from the gene. So when you find there's a non-donor allele, it means that you got a recombination there. And then after you do that, you select for the background marker. So the nice thing about these three steps is that uh, in each step, you, you minimize the amount of work. For example, you don't have to do background selection on all these or these. You only have to do the background selection here. And by this time, you've already removed most of the, of the lines. So it reduces your work, and it makes a very fast uh, recovery of the genes. This is Pavel from Bangladesh, who was a student also who worked on this uh, problem. Most people call these two as background selection. Uh, but we uh, change it a little bit because we feel that this is actually different in there. 
it's not really different from the, the procedure outlined by Steve Pensley. And so um, uh, we had a project uh, from BMC. Uh, Abdul and I had a, uh, this BMC project, and uh, that allowed us to produce uh, six uh, varieties. And uh, these are the six varieties that were the early someone varieties produced by that procedure. And uh, it, you can see the way they perform. So they, the performance is really uh, night and day between these varieties and the originals next to them. And uh, the work was really very high quality in my opinion. Uh, I want to thank the people who were involved. This is uh, Bay Rodriguez and uh, Gloria Pamplona who did the initial ones and then and Darlene Sanchez uh, joined our project after Bain left. And uh, the fact that uh, we sent the seed out and we never heard anything about any problem. No problem with uh, segregation, no problem with background or anything. So the work they did was really excellent, very high quality. And uh, we have developed two new ones. This is Chehorong, the most popular variety uh, in, in Indonesia by uh, one Indonesian uh, Scholars in the role, and this one, uh, which uh, Darlene uh, produced, RC18 sub 1. And uh, in initial, our, our initial testing, they look really excellent here. here. They, they perform really well, and so they look promising. And uh, we hope this one could at least replace, uh, or either one, replace the IRC4 sub 1, which is uh, highly susceptible to Tungro. But it looks very good in India. So most of these varieties are. In the process of release, in fact, these six of, of these six, um, I think by by the end of this year, nine of them will be released as varieties and distributed, disseminated. And this one probably could also be released. So it's pretty good uh, success record of how to develop these kind of varieties. Uh, you know, normally with uh, breeding from scratch, uh, you you're lucky lucky to get one out of a million release. So uh, this procedure is very conservative, but. You know, it's a, it's a good way to get materials that you can put in the farmer's field. Uh, these are some of the other varieties that have been released with the sub one gene, but not produced by uh, marker-assisted backcrossing. So just as a, uh, as a summary of the sub one lines, uh, they have about half ton, uh, one, uh, sorry, one to two tons uh, yield advantage under submergence, but in the extreme cases, they could be more than three tons higher yield. And in fact, it could be the case of uh, uh, zero versus three or four times, so it's, it's a big difference. Uh, they are tolerant from about one week after seeding to booting stage, so it's a wide range. Uh, so far, no negative effects of sub-1 gene. Um, and another benefit is that you avoid the transplanting cost and yield declines from replanting. So if you've got submergence in the early stage, then the farmers will replant the field, and they have to go out and find seedlings or replant or whatever, and then they so it's a, there's a cost and there's a yield reduction from replanting. So uh, this way you would avoid that. If, if you have some work that's a little bit later where it's too late for replanting, then of course the benefit is, is even more. And finally, the very rapid upscaling. Uh, so by varietal replacement, these are mega varieties, so they're widely accepted already by the farmers. So it's very quick to actually scale them up for production. So these are some of the benefits of the uh, sub-1 varieties. Now, um, unfortunately, uh, and of course I've been involved with all the major stresses, dr uh, drought and salinity, as well as submergence. And unfortunately for drought, there's no like sub-1 gene that, you, that has the same effect on drought, uh, and it's unlikely that we would find that. However, there's been uh, major progress on drought tolerance in the last 10 years. And uh, you know, when I first came here in 2001, I still had some doubt, how far can we go in drought tolerance? And that was rapidly uh, changed by the work that was going on uh, earlier from uh, Bridges' time with Gary Atlan, Renee, Renee Lafitte, and now with Arvin's group, and uh, they made great progress. Uh, these are some of the, vari the varieties, uh, and this one is the Bagidan. Uh, is, you know, this variety has about a one time yield advantage or, uh, under drought, but we're not talking about one time like three to four or four to five. We're talking about 0.5 to 1.5. So that makes a huge difference uh, to a poor farmer in a rain fed environment. So the uh, Sabaki Don looks very promising and it's being promoted in the Strasser project and I think it's going to be covering a large area. In addition to the braiding work, of course, you, you all know that there are some major QTLs for drought 
and those QTLs are being transferred into the make rice like swarm. So uh, there's been huge progress on drought and uh, salinity as the same. Uh, there's been good projects for inland salinity, uh, mainly developed by places like Carnot, but uh, with Erie's uh, help. And then uh, these are two Erie varieties, released one in Bangladesh, one in uh, India. Actually, this is not released yet, but uh, hopefully soon. And they're doing well in the coastal saline areas in the dry season, and they're spreading rapidly. In addition, of course, you're all familiar with the work on uh, salt hall and other QTLs that uh, RKA Glenn and, and Abdul have been working on. So those, those things are going ahead as well. And I think that uh, they're all also looking at combining salt hall and salt for wet season saline areas. So in the, in the coastal area. So there's been a lot of, a lot of progress on both uh, drought and salinity, uh, in addition to submergence. But you know, submergence is a special case because uh, salt one gene, which we don't have for those other uh, stresses. Okay, so I'm in my last chapter now of my thesis. And uh, I'm going to just talk a little bit about further progress. And uh, I think we're just at the beginning of the success of stress tolerant rice. And so it's important that we don't uh, lose our focus and think that, okay, we can relax now because we made the big things. <coughs> we're really at the beginning of the success. And so it's really important to, uh, even I would say, I would hope we can uh, strengthen our effort to really carry these through to a larger scale uh, successes. So uh, this, is a, this is a short list of what I, I see as important opportunities for stress tolerant rice. Um, just, just some examples, there, there are probably many that I, that I didn't include. Uh, more mega varieties can be converted to stress tolerance. And we're starting to do that with collaborative projects now with national partners. So that'll be even better than if we can do it at Erie. We can actually help uh, people, the scientists in other countries to develop varieties in their, uh, that are adapted to their condition. I think that would be even better. Higher levels of tolerance. Uh, we can get higher levels of tolerance than we have now. Uh, multiple stress tolerance. So combining tolerance to more than one stress because we know these are not isolated things. Uh, combining stress tolerance with other traits like higher yields, quality, biotic stresses. Still a lot of work to be done in this area, and then also <coughs> new body stress. So uh, some of these, like adverse soils and heat, we, we still have not done enough, and we can, we can do more on those as well. So I think these are um, some examples of some of the things that could be done to really take advantage of the work that has been uh, done so far. And in addition, I think that uh, the chance of success for all of these is very high. So, so these are not uh, risky kind of uh, activities. These uh, things can be done as long as we, we have the effort to do it. So that's a good thing. I know um, when you look at uh, potential impacts in the future, you can pr project that you know, you'll probably get high impact if you can increase the yield potential, then you can get definitely a high impact. And that will cut across every environment. But it's still, um, you know, the exact way to do that is still some, there's some question. Uh, obviously, we have to do it. Uh, it's important. As our C4 rice. So C4 rice, of course, is going to take a long time and also risky. But things that have this big potential impact, then you can, you can do that. But you also need uh, plenty of things to do which are less risky. And these are less risky. And they can have uh, also an impact. So I think it's really important to, to think of, of, of them that way. Um, I'll give you an example from our work on stagnant flooding. Stagnant flooding is unrelated to some urban. It's uh, they're, they don't they're not the same trade at all. And in fact, some of the submergence swamp varieties are not very good at all under stagnant flooding. Stagnant flooding means that you have a gradual uh, flooding over a long period of time. So usually the flooding is like a one or two months or more. And it goes up to 50 centimeters, sometimes a little bit higher. In fact, deep water rice is an extreme example of stagnant flooding. So um, the, the problem is uh, uh, in any particular place, you could have both stagnant flooding and submergent stress. So ideally, we'd like to have tolerance to both of them. But one of the best submergent swamp varieties uh, now, Swarna Sub 1, is not uh, very good at stagnant flooding. And we always uh, 
recommend to the farmers, and that's officially put in all the literature, that uh, these varieties are not for the areas which have stagnant flooding. So in those areas now, we're starting to get some new breeding lines which have power plant heights. One is quite short. I think that's probably the main reason that it doesn't do well under stagnant flooding. It's quite short, and uh, these varieties have intermediate <coughs> heights, and they still have good agronomic traits. So we're working on that strongly now. Uh, this is some work on evaluation. So you can see uh, a field where we evaluate stagnant flooding, and there's a lot of variation. Uh, some of the, uh, the varieties are gone. Uh, so that this is stagnant flooding which occurs uh, relatively rapidly. So what we can do is we can actually manage the water level in these tanks. And we put maximum stress on swarness of one. So what, we, what you do, actually do is you keep the water above swarness of one. And that and swarness of one doesn't elongate, right, because it's submersion tolerance. So you can keep the water above it and eventually it just runs out of energy and, and it dies. But some of these other lines uh, do quite well. And if you look at the field, uh, this is a superimposed the work on uh, screening for the sub-1 gene. So many of the sub-1 lines uh, have done 40, but uh, the one with plus and, and no rice. But you can find things like this, okay? Uh, a, a, a very good uh, in standard flooding tolerance as well as sub-1 gene. So uh, we think that we can make a lot of progress on this. Uh, after this stage, of course, it, it's not finished. Um, you, you may have something that looks really good, but then uh, when it's after, after flowering, it, it lodges, so it falls over in the water. <coughs> or it may have uh, sterility problems. So there's still other things we have to do. And, and so I think there's a lot more work that has to be done on this, but at least you, you could see from the slide that uh, there's no really barrier to actually doing, to actually coming up with these kind of projects. So that's good, and uh, also thanks to uh, Jerome, our new uh, the researcher, and a uh, group of uh, our technicians, both in the field and the lab, who have been doing the great work on this breeding program. Now, um, one thing that I think is quite interesting is making uh, sequential upgrades to varieties. We always talk about you know, upgrading mega varieties. It means uh, add the sub one gene to Swana or something else. So you, you basically, it's kind of an upgrade, just like you uh, you buy a new software, you know, and it has some new characteristic. It's still the same software, but it has some new features. So we find this upgrading of these uh, mega varieties, and um, we can do this by integrating the major genes. And uh, the idea we have is okay. Once you make the first one, then uh, you you want to add something else. You want to add bacterial blight to one sub one bacterial blight resistance. So add add the gene for that. Uh, you want to add uh, salt parts, so add the gene for that and so forth. So you can keep adding these genes. Um, this is an example I just mentioned. And uh, then what, what, how do you, what do you call these things that are upgraded? You keep coming out with new ones. Every, maybe every few years you come out with a new one. So what I was wondering is maybe that, that the, the naming system has to be adopted, for example, like a, like a software. So we have sworn as 1.1. Or maybe we have Swarna 2012 or something like this. Uh, there'll be a lot of these, and uh, it'll, it could become confusing. But I do think that um, this is a, a this is a viable strategy, and uh, this is something that we've already started working on now. Now I want to show the the problem of uh, linkage drag in relation to sequential upgrading of mega varieties. This uh, is an example of your variety sub one which um, there was no recombinant selection. So you ended up getting um, about a uh, big, big piece of chromosome that was added. That's about uh, you know, 10 to 15 megabases of chromosome. And so uh, basically you're 96% recovery of recurrent parent. Um, I, I personally am not very comfortable with 96% because that 4% could have uh, many things in it. So I'm a little bit concerned about that, but many people are doing this because they don't want to, they, they say it's too much work to do the recombinant selection, so I'm not going to do it. So they end up with that, but if you go the whole way, you end up with that, okay, so you get 99%. <clears throat> now, it could be that that 4% doesn't make much difference, and in fact, some breeders have told me, well, maybe you'll get something beneficial in the 4%. So. Sure, maybe, maybe you will. 
so it depends on what you want. But if you have too much difference, keep in mind that if you have too much difference in your upgraded mega variety, it, then it's not an upgraded mega variety. It's a new variety. It has to be considered completely as a new variety, and you have to go through the whole process of evaluating that just like it was a completely new variety. Whereas with an upgraded mega variety, most countries are, are interested to get these as replacements of the original, and, and they have an expedited process. Now, let's imagine you, you have a sequentially upgraded mega variety, and you have three genes that you've added, but you didn't want to do a common selection. So you end up with 91% recovery. This is not the same variety. This is a completely different variety, 10% uh, change. So, you know, I'm not saying that you can't do this. You can do it, and no problem, but it's just not an upgraded variety. So it's something that you keep in mind when you're, you're doing this work, because it, it seems to me, in my opinion, uh, it's worth the extra effort to get the completely upgraded variety. In this case, it makes a huge difference when you have three genes. So that, that's the way that, that I would do it. I think, uh, how far can we go? How many genes can we add? Um, when you're adding like 1% for each gene, uh, the strict way, then eventually you will, you'll end up with a different variety, also probably with those, with those uh, linkages. And that's one reason for um, isolating the genes themselves. Then, then what you could do is you could actually replace the whole procedure with trans uh, transgenic procedure. And you could add um, four or five genes in a single shot and that would be that would be better. So, so eventually we, we may run out of uh, the potential for this upgraded mega variety. But on the other hand, most of these genes we still don't know which gene which gene uh, confers the trait. So there's still quite a bit of work to actually identify those genes. And that's one I think that's a justification for why we really have to go ahead to try to identify the actual genes. Now, um, my. My talk didn't cover all the aspects of stress tolerance in rice, stress tolerance in rice. And uh, it didn't do justice to the whole story, which involves a lot more than just breeding, developing the lines. I, I, of course, I wanted to focus on that because that was probably the main role that our group did. But I've been involved, of course, with Strauss in uh, program one. And they, there's a whole uh, holistic way to look at solving the problem. So once you have stress tolerance varieties, you have to evaluate them for their acceptability by the farmers. So for example, I learned from uh, Thelma that uh, they really like Swarna sub one because you know, it matches what they, what they expect from the Swarna. And uh, they're really happy with it. And so that kind of feedback you need uh, when you're dealing with this kind of environment. Uh, you need to do seed production, okay? In the past, we just set up, okay, there's a variety. Uh, somebody else will do the seed production, everything will happen. But it doesn't. So uh, with Strasa, we have a very good project on seed production, and we've been producing huge amounts of seed. And of course, Erie is not producing the seed. It's, it's done by the seed companies, by the uh, uh, NGOs, by all kinds of agencies involved with seed production. But uh, we have a, a coordinating role, and as, as Umesh likes to say, a catalyst role in that. There's information that has to go along with the seed, so you have uh, books in the, in the local languages that have to be produced. And we've been starting to get some involvement in that, although, of course, uh, it, again, it's done by the national programs, but we sometimes help them with the tax and so forth. And then you have to optimize uh, the, the management practices, all kinds of things. So I, I may not have to put everything here, but th these are some of the major things you have to think about for the whole picture of how to achieve impact with, uh, with stress tolerant varieties, which would apply to all the stresses. In addition, uh, you need uh, a kind of coordination of these activities. So we have uh, projects like Strasa and Network like Cure, which help us with uh, making a coordinated program to address all these issues. So I think these have uh, served us very well in that regard. Uh, finally, I'd like to just mention that uh, I, I don't have a slide to mention everyone that I, that I kind of cited in this talk. Um, but there's been a lot of uh, Erie scientists involved, which I'm really thankful for their work, uh, especially in our Strasse project, in the BMZ project, and all kinds of projects. Scientists uh, in the NARS as well, and my research group, uh, also Abdel and uh, Digrid and other people who are working uh, on submergence. Uh, the program one uh, ladies also, who have helped us immensely to carry on many of these activities. 
Uh, I think Hay was correct in, in pointing out in my first slide that I highlighted just very briefly some of the things I did, but obviously being a division head and a program leader was a big job and uh, one that I've many times felt uh, inadequate to, to, to really do well, but uh, these people made it uh, look very nice, so thank, I, I'm thankful for them uh, for that work. And it was very uh, rewarding for me to, to try to help people working on these things. And last but not least, uh, my family and the family of my staff, uh, I'm really uh, grateful for them, for all their support. And uh, where am I going now? Well, I'm basically, I'm going to Mars. <laughs> uh, not this Mars. Um, it's, a, it's a food company, Mars. Uh, and I'm, I'm working for the food business, which is Uncle Ben's Rice. So if you haven't uh, tried Uncle Ben's rice, um, I'm not saying to go out and try it. It's mainly for, it's, it's a little bit expensive and it's mainly for uh, Americans and Europeans. Uh, but we do have a few other product, products which uh, you might enjoy. So probably you could, you could stick to those products for the future uh, if you want to use any more products. And, uh, I'll be based here. Uh, I'm really happy that the company has uh, allowed me to be based in, uh, in UC Davis. So it's a kind of a uh, very nice uh, opportunity for me. Uh, I, it'll be my first chance working for a private company, but at least I will also have a joint appointment in the university. They have a very good relation with the university. And so that, I hope, will give me a lot of opportunities for uh, further collaboration with uh, the work going on here at Erie. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention.